Welcome to Delta Waterfowl's The Voice of the Duck Hunter podcast. I'm your host, Joel Bryce, Vice President of Waterfowl and Hunter Recruitment Programs. Today is podcast number six, and it's an exciting one. We're talking about the predicted fall flight of ducks for this upcoming hunting season. So if you're a duck hunter from the West Coast to the East Coast, stay tuned, and we're going to cover um, your forecast. So to help me cover this subject today is two familiar faces, Dr. Frank Rohr, uh, President and Chief Scientist, and John Devney, he's not a doctor, but he's pretty darn smart. So he's Delta's <laughs> senior vice president. So we're sitting... definitely not a doctor. <laughs> no, not a doctor, but really smart. So you won't be able to tell the two apart. So this is our favorite, I don't know, it's my favorite podcast location. We're sitting here on the shores of the Missouri River. So if you're a science buff or history buff, I mean, there's, you know, we have Lewis and Clark. Um, I try to imagine sometimes... Uh, Custer going across this river. I don't know how the heck he did it. So it's pretty cool. Um, so for those of you that, uh, that, that aren't viewing, now you know where we're sitting. Um, so again, guys, we're going to talk about the fall flight of ducks for this upcoming, upcoming duck season, not geese. We're going to cover that in a, in a later um, podcast. So we're not coming up with something that's brand new. Um, we've been talking for decades. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has published the fall flight of ducks. Um, is that right, Frank? Right. Yep. Okay. So as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, the ingredients for a fall flight of ducks. So you have the May population survey of ducks. You have the May pond counts. Historically, you had July surveys as well. John, what were those surveys in July? You know, the, the surveys in July, and I think, man, Frank, those were probably cut in the mid 1990s, late 1990s. Yep. Um, you know, basically they were to index what the prairie habitat looked like in July is a benchmark of what we suspected production would look like. So we measured both July ponds and July broods to give us an indication of what we might see in terms of production. Because what we've learned um, is that, you know, while the bee pop is really important and May ponds are really important, we know that it's that production that occurs on the breeding grounds that really drives the fall flight and what really drives hunter success. Right. So let me let me just jump in. The bee pop is this this count, which we call the May surveys. Mm -hmm. It's the breeding population and habitat survey is what it is. And and we fly and when I say we, I'm talking about the waterfowl community. It's largely the mm -hmm. US Fish and Wildlife Service planes with state biologists that, that help a lot on this thing. And we fly this set of transect lines and we count ducks. We count ducks and we count wetlands. And so that's our most important set of data for, but as Devney has said many times, he is a bright guy. Um, we don't shoot the breeding population. We shoot the fall flight. And so you can do a little schematic and look at what production means. And it means a huge amount. I mean, we're typically going to, you know, double the population in an average year. And we're going to do much better than that in a good year. And in a drought year, we're going to only increase the population by 50%. But it, it's the recruitment that really matters. And that's part of the problem is that we don't actually measure that. We index that largely from the water conditions. So we, so the July surveys... We're, so okay, so you have your, you set the table with water and a breeding population, right. and then a couple decades ago, there were July surveys, mm -hmm. and that was brood counts and another look at water. Right. So right. you can see this progression of breeding ducks, right. production, and then it was still an estimate right. of what does the fall flight going to look like, right? So that's right. kind of where we used to be. A couple decades ago, you take away the July work, mm -hmm. so now... Now we're down into modeling or better guesses or predictions of what the fall flight are going to look like. Right. Now, we're talking about the traditional survey area. Frank, when we talk about right. that May survey, where is it taking place? So it's taking place, uh, you know, the, the most important part of the survey happens in, the, in what we call the prairie pothole region. And this is 10% of the duck breeding habitat that accounts for in any given year, anywhere from 50% to 80% of the key ducks that we really worry about. And so that's the most important area. And it's most important because it's the most variable area. Mm -hmm. Now you got this large chunk of boreal forest, the closed spruce forest of, of Northern Canada, um, but that's much less variable. 
And so, you know, if we didn't count that every year, it wouldn't be a big deal. But the prairies, that's where it can be dry or wet. And so that's where we really need these duck counts. Okay. Let me go back one point. Sure. When we do the May count, we can separate it. And so we get a count of mallards and we get a count of pintails right. and gadwall. And, and all those things make a difference. Part of the problem with the July survey is you can't tell mallards and pintails because the males have all left. They're, they're molting. And so you get a brown hen with a bunch of ducklings. Right. So you can index production, but you didn't know whether gadwall and bluings had had a great year and mallards had, had done poorly. Now, that, that's pretty uncommon. But, but probably, it, as John pointed out, it was the wetlands that were more important because if we have yeah. a lot of water in July, that's a good sign. Yeah. And because you have higher brood survival, right? right? Well, you have well, and that's Lots the interesting thing. Yeah. It, it, if you look at, you know, if you look at May ponds, May ponds get the ducks here, right? Mm -hmm. it, but over time, historically, what we've known to happen is we're wettest typically in April and May when the ducks are first okay. here, when the snow melts. We've had, you know, probably some spring rains. And then we typically see a degradation of wetland mm -hmm. condition over the course of the summer. And things just dry up. The temporaries and the seasonals blank out. And But the years we know we have crazy good production mm -hmm. are those years where those temporaries and seasonals are sustained because it drives high re-nesting rates right. in, in big parts of the prairies. And even parts of the prairies that you'd look at and say are beat up, have poor nest success. If it's wet and females are nesting three, four, or five times, they're gonna be successful. Yep. We have high duckling survival. So all those things, when when you have a situation where your May pond conditions are good and your July yep. pond, dish, pond conditions are good to great, those are the bumper crops. Sure. And, and we've lost that sort of systematic right. i mean we certainly understand it we saw it last year actually in north dakota we're last seeing it year. this year yeah. in, in north dakota like we started phenomenally wet in north dakota pretty much everywhere mm -hmm. and we out here in western north dakota dried out and right. so you know there are big seasonal ponds a half mile from here that held more pairs than i've ever seen in in six years of looking at them and and they're completely dry as of a month ago but you go to eastern North Dakota. And John was just traveling it's through there. Wetter, and it's I, so it's wet. wet as I've ever I seen. I mean, it. you're yeah. looking at it and thinking, "Holy Christmas! We are producing ducks. We've got great yeah. nesting, lots of re-nesting, and in every single study of broods, when we have high water, they do better. And so, you know, you got high brood survival. So those are the great, great components great. Okay. for great yeah. production. Got it. Yeah. So now, when we talk about that May survey. That spans all the way up into Alaska, right? It does, right. Okay. We count much of the boreal forest, not all of it. And then we count a lot of the, the important river deltas and, and spots. If you look at the map of the survey areas, you see a lot of hot spots in Alaska. Um, and, you know, big river deltas, right. the yukon Kuskokwim Delta, the McKenzie River Delta. These are these are great spots. Deltas are always productive. Right. I mean, we Throughout the world, we farm deltas because all that silt runs down. It's it. great habitat. It's great habitat for ducks, great habitat for farming. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think in my opinion, so you have the central part of the United States and Canada, Mississippi and Central Flyway. We talk about yep. this survey area, the PPR. Dominant percentage of the duck population comes from this area. So that really, for me, it's really easy to say, okay, so in the central Mississippi Flyway, here's how your duck population should shake out or your, your fall flight. What about the outer flyways? Let's, you know, we're kind of setting the table here. Right. We're bearing the lead, as, right. as a good friend of ours, Tori McCormick, would say. <laughs> um, you know, but right. I think it's important for people to understand, how do we get here? So how does the you know, Pacific Flyway get there? Yeah. You, yeah, I mean, if you look at the Pacific Flyway, and, and I think the Atlantic Flyway is the same way. It's same, really dependent yeah. upon the duck species, yeah. right? So if you're a duck hunter in California, you know, specifically, you're reliant on an incredible amount of your production takes place locally. Mm -hmm. And for Dr. Some ducks. Of some, for some ducks. For mallards. For mallards, right. for know, gadwall. Huge. Yeah, right. Um, but, you know, if you look, if you, you know, a lot of California hunters care a great deal about pintail. We know yeah. that. Yeah. Well, those pintail are coming from. They're not breeding in California. They're not breeding in California. Yeah. They're yeah. coming out of the, primarily coming out of Western Canada, Alberta and Saskatchewan, the same places. Arkansas, Mississippi, right. Louisiana. Through Alaska too, coming. probably, and, right? Yep. That whole... And then okay. Alaska is really important. Although, I think 
a number of Pacific Flyway hunters have been led to believe that Alaska is more important um, to them. Alaska is very important. And as Prairie Canada has declined in pintail production, which we've covered previously, mm -hmm. um, Alaska's elevated in importance. But so, yeah, so if you're, you know, the, the duck shot and the mallard shot in California is probably from California, some from Southern Alberta, probably okay. some from the Intermountain West and, you know, British Columbia and Washington and Oregon, places like that. Um, and if you care about pintails, those ducks are coming in green winged teal, which is a really important species uh, for California hunters. Those ducks are coming from, you know, primarily coming from Canada. So yeah. it's, it's really variable. And in yeah. the East is the same way, right? Yeah. Frank? Yeah. If we flip over to the East, you, you have the same thing. Um, and, and it's even more dramatic. California raises a higher fraction of their ducks than does the Atlantic Flyway. The Atlantic Flyway, those mallards out there, they're from largely the Northeast. Okay. So straight north of the Atlantic Flyway up into Canada. Now that area is surveyed too. That area is surveyed as well. Right. But, okay. uh, but you know, for an awful lot of the ducks, the prairie pothole region matters. Like, right. you know, most of the gadwall, all of the gadwall on the East Coast are coming from here in the Dakotas, okay. you know, Saskatchewan. Uh, and that's true of bluing teal. There's no bluing teal production to speak of, okay. you know, in the northern segments of the Atlantic Flyway. So, so and for Frank always flyway, never talks about diving ducks. Because, oh yeah, that's but, true. I, mean, I have a bit of a bias. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you take yeah. scoff that yeah. are shot in the Atlantic yeah. Flyway. A lot of them come from the Western Boreal yeah. Forest. We've learned about ringnecks. The ringnecks are exciting because mm -hmm. you know that's that's a key species, if, particularly if you're in the South. If you're in Georgia and Florida, ringnecks are are the number two duck, mm -hmm. and yet. You know, they thought that they were coming. They've even built harvest models around them coming from from eastern Canada, by and large. And yet, when we put transmitters on mm -hmm. ringnecks, they're in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and and the Northwest Territories and Nunavut. You know, a mm -hmm. few in Minnesota, but they're definitely western. And so, mm -hmm. so prior to this telemetry study we're doing, did you predict that? I know I wouldn't have predicted that. Yeah, so that's that, how yeah. cool is that, right? right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's super exciting. And then yeah. the cans and redheads. I cans mean, the Chesapeake redheads. Bay yeah. and all yeah. that tradition yeah. of canvas yeah. back shooting or, or shooting redheads in North Carolina, those are all prairie ducks. And yeah, so again, prairie parkland ducks okay. from here. Yeah. You know, so I think north. we've set the table for holy yeah. cow. This is, I, you know what? That's what's exciting to me. I know growing up, I thought I'm going to be a wildlife biologist. And when I thought of, I'm going to, you know, if I'm a state biologist, I have two counties, I have all the rabbits and deer, and I thought, you know, that could be rewarding, but you'll figure it out. Yeah. But with waterfowl, you'll never figure it out. It's yeah. such a complicated system yeah. shared mm -hmm. from Canada through Mexico into yeah. Central America. So I think we've set the table that predicting the fall flight, even with great data, is a bit of an art form, right? Yep. Yeah. It's a, it's there, you have all these indices of breeding populations, yep. water used to have broods and then you'd say this is what we think right. now you can always look back on the next year's data and say how good did we do and you can kind of adjust some of those estimates going forward right. but okay now here we are in the COVID-19 era the new normal it's middle of August and some of the key ingredients are <laughs> We're gone, right? Down what are Almost those all of the key yeah. ingredients? Yeah. There you go. Yeah, all, yeah. I mean, all, actually, they're all gone. they're all gone. I mean, and, and you look at, you know, you look at the data we're lacking this year. California has had a long running breeding survey, didn't happen. Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, long running breeding survey didn't happen. We have had the survey, I think, in the Northeast U U.S. and the Eastern breeding grounds since 1991, early 1990s. Yeah. Long period of time. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, that's a good long data set uh, gone, and mm -hmm. and we lack the information from basically Sioux Falls to Alaska, which is driving a lot of hunting regulations, and that's gone too. And we're we're down to you know, thank goodness for Mike Samansky's tenacity in in the North Dakota Game and Fish. Um, that's the only empirical data we have on ducks anywhere this year. So the the May breeding and pond didn't happen. did right. not happen. Right. So, Anywhere. So, so what? And I mean, so kind of pause the, on that one for a right. second, right? I mean, that's been going on since the yeah. 50s. 1955. Yep. Uh, yeah. Biologists, yeah. hundreds. This, by the way, plane. is the largest sur worldwide survey of, of wildlife that happens annually. So 
this is a big deal to lose that data set. Um, and, and we're very fortunate, as John Devney said, that, that Mike Szymanski, the head of, of Waterfowl here in North Dakota, said, mm -hmm. hey, we're going to run it. And they've been actually been running theirs for over 70 years. Right. And so they have never missed a year. And it's impressive. And they did a really good job. And so we have a little bit of quantitative data. Mm -hmm. North Dakota is a very important state. Um, and so it's great that we have data for, for a vital state. But we'd sure like to have it for, you know, there are five vital states, in mm -hmm. my opinion. South Dakota, North Dakota, and then the three, I said states. <laughs> I don't think of Canada. <laughs> you, John, you, didn't, you let him have that Manitoba, yeah. Saskatchewan, on. Alberta. Rules here. You know, there's, there's breeding habitat in Minnesota, but it's not extensive. In Iowa, you know, much of that mm -hmm. was, was drained long before we had wetland protection. Um, so, you know, we'd love to have data from all those regions. But what we're going to do is talk about our impressions and the impressions of other people you know right. Rocco Morano you know down in in South Dakota state waterfowl biologist he's driven the state we know lots of people down there we've driven part of the state and and we know it was wet and there were a lot of ducks right can we quantify it no but we know it's you know right. so can give you some impressions of, yeah. of what's happening so we'll talk about our one piece of data that's yeah. the North Dakota survey and then the approach we're going to take is we're going to go out to the West Coast, talk about a Pacific flyway fall forecast, maybe lump the center two flyways, yep. and then head out east. Yep. So who wants to give a Cliff's Notes version of the North Dakota survey results? Well, North Dakota, as we mentioned, did the survey. They actually do two surveys. They, they have continued to do a brood survey right. as well, okay. which is really cool. Okay, and and they do their survey differently. It's you know it's not based on air counts, it's ground yeah. counts. So, the North Dakota survey was was showed what we knew. It's impressively mm -hmm. wet, six wettish year. And remember, we've been doing this survey almost seventy five years. So mm -hmm. that's an impressively wet. wet year. Wet year. We had phenomenal rains last fall and and a fair winter. So it started out super wet, and we had a lot of ducks, thirteenth highest I believe, or something mm -hmm. like that. Over. Around four million ducks, which, which is, is sort of the benchmark, the new benchmark, the new great. benchmark for great. You know, yep. it's way above the long term mm -hmm. average, but but we're getting kind of used to this, and you know, abundance of water. Okay, so North Dakota had a great uh, pair count and a great uh, wetland count, and then the brood survey said you know it was average or slightly above average. So you combine great numbers of breeding pairs with right. a typical average year. And that varied, you know, it's right. not as good in the West and much better in the East. So, so North Dakota looks great. That's the quantitative data. And that would match up to what John and I have seen driving around the state well, and, okay. and the other Delta biologists. And I think it's a pretty good proxy for South Dakota, right? You know, I think, I mean, I think I'd feel pretty comfortable. What right. we saw in yeah. North Dakota, yeah. I would suggest is probably things were at least as good, maybe even a little I, better I for think species. I actually better. Like, I mean, yeah. Yeah, when you talk to the state waterfowl biologist for South Dakota, he says, "I've never seen such a wet year." So, and we thought last year was amazing. Mm -hmm. So we got back to back incredibly wet years in South Dakota. So it's funny who you know what good conditions are quite subjective, right? So we love wet conditions. I think there's a lot of oh. people in Northeast South Dakota that aren't too happy with oh, those yeah, wet the, conditions. Yeah. The farm community was hurt this year yeah. because it was so wet in the spring. It was tough to get in and plant. In well, it was, in, in, you know, yeah. Frank mentioned, you know, I think Frank mentioned something that's important that I don't think folks intuitively understand. We set the stage for good breeding habitat conditions way before spring in yeah. most years. Yeah. In not all years. Some years we're dry in the fall and we're dry in the winter and then we have big spring rains and we can get really wet. But mm -hmm. really, in April. Yeah, yeah, some yeah. those sorts of things. Yeah. But really, foundationally, if you want good breeding habitat in spring, it starts in September and October and get really wet, have a big frost. Suit. Well, I'm telling you, it was really wet here. Mm -hmm. It was really wet in North Dakota. It was really wet in South Dakota. It was really wet in Western Minnesota to the point where we had millions of acres a corn still standing oh, and yeah. it was time to seed this spring. Yeah. So yeah, the farmers had a tough time because, you know, they couldn't get in and harvest their crops because it was so incredibly wet last year. Then it was still wet this spring. Um, you know, I think there's a million acres of prevent plant in North Dakota this year, which is a USDA term for places that farmers just simply couldn't farm. Right. So, 
All right, well, I think that sets the table pretty well. And drum roll, here comes our <laughs> fall flight forecast for ducks. So tune in. So we're going to go out to the Pacific Flyway. Yep. John, do you want to hand Yeah, on sure. I mean, you know, again, the Pacific Flyway is this sort of two-headed monster, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're a mallard shooter in California, which there are a lot of, right? It's an important duck everywhere. It's really important in California. Um, that mallard population has been in decline for some time. Oh. And, and I, you know, California, I think over the last 10, maybe 15 years has had some wet years, certainly, but you know, it's, it's been dry. If and, you characterize it, you'd say it's dry. Yeah, it's dry. And, and, and California, you know, those mallards out there, they're a bit of a different breed of cat. You know, we've mm -hmm. Delta's had some history in doing research out there and obviously California waterfall and USGS are doing good research out there, but they're a different breed of cat, but they're really important to the harvest and that population has been in decline. And, and I, I don't see, again, we don't have a population estimate for California mallards this year, but based on the droughty conditions I had in the Valley, a lot of those ducks breed in the central Valley of California, which is the big ag, well, the big rice ag footprint mm -hmm. kind of, you know, runs, uh, you know, west of San Francisco, you know, Sacramento and some mm -hmm. of those places are in it. And, you know, it was one of those dry, it was one of those dry years again. And so I think, you know, the production of local mallards, uh, production of local gadwall, production of local cinnamon teal, it's probably not going to be that great. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, on the other hand, you know, Alaska is Alaska. I mean, I think part of the reason why everybody's so excited about having lots of numbers of pintails in Alaska is it doesn't have the incredible variation that Alberta and Saskatchewan have. Right. Those river deltas right. are river deltas, yeah. right? And so they don't have this big variability in, in breeding habitat. So you can it, count on yeah, you're gonna those count on, uh, source those are areas. Those going to be a sort, of, sort of like a bond, you know, a bond fund in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. It's going to spit out X number of docks at yeah. some pace all the time. Never phenomenal, oh. never, never terrible. Yeah, that's you know, right. Sort of intermediate. Okay. Yeah. I think yeah. one quick pause here. I think this isn't just John's opinion or Frank's opinion. I think one of the cool things about Delta with our student research program, we have a network of biologists and managers all over the United right, States right, and Canada. Right. We know people. Right. And we're constantly talking to people right. about this and other things. But then also as the Duck Hunters organization, we talk to a lot of duck hunters. Right. And so, John, Frank, I yeah. know you guys are out there yeah. talking with California duck hunters, yeah. West Coast duck hunters, Western Canada. And so, okay, sure, in the end it's opinion, but it's based on awful lot of information from other people right, right? right. so yeah. let you finish the other thing is and i i i guess i was sort of underestimating how good alberta had right. looked um alberta's a you know alberta's a funny place because alberta's very different you take the southern part of alberta and it's really dry and really arid it's it's really prairie country but mm -hmm. the more you move north you get it's into short more grass prairie too. Short I grass mean, it's, prairie. it's not prairie that gets 30 inches of rain it's prairie yeah. that gets 15 inches it's of rattlesnake rain. country yeah, yeah for sure yeah. and boom or bust boom or yeah, bust right. but when it booms it's a real boom yeah. and yeah. and then you get into you know you get into the more of the parkland areas and so cal you know Alberta was in really pretty good shape this year. And I think I was sort of underestimating that until the last couple of weeks and hearing and talking to folks. That yeah. Alberta seemed to have been pretty good. We we know that as you go from Manitoba into Saskatchewan into Alberta, you go from quite wet to arid. And so we typically think that when Saskatchewan's dry, then Alberta's a desert. Right. Okay. But this was a funny year. Saskatchewan is poor this year. Saskatchewan is the dry spot of the of the five major areas here in the in Prairie Pothole region. Mm -hmm. And Alberta was wet as heck. Mm -hmm. And it was it was wet from north to south. Mm -hmm. So it, it was quite interesting. You know, so I think, you know, yeah. some of those, you know, the pintail that settled there yeah. and and mallards and you know, Alberta's got a lot, you know, big breeding population, not what it did twenty five, thirty years ago. But it's an important place, and the habitat conditions were pretty good. I think we could expect so you those know, ducks coming from the western prairies of, of, of the Prairie Pothole region, Alberta and western Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. They tend, not a hard ass rule, but they tend to go west. Okay. So the, those are the Pacific Flyway pintails. 
Okay. And the ones farther east here in the Dakotas and eastern Saskatchewan tend to be the central part of the country. Okay. Louisiana and Texas. And so, and so you know, for pintails, Alberta is actually... California pintails. Yeah, yeah. California. Yeah. Okay. West know. Coast. Yeah, yeah, West Coast pintails. You know, they're going to have a better year than, than, than some other parts. The birds that, okay. that come out of South Saskatchewan. Well, that was a dry area. And pintails are the first bird to suffer from a dry area. Because, you know, what pintails like is the super shallow ephemeral stuff. And that was dry from the get-go. Right. Yeah. So In Saskatchewan. In summary, for the Pacific Flyway, sounds like an average year? I, I, yeah, I, I'd probably put it a little bit above average, just okay. knowing how important mallards are to West Coast hunters. Um, Gadwaller really has become really, really important. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a real mixed bag. I think, you know, there's probably going to be some bright spots of those pintail that come out of that sort of stable area of mm-hmm. the north and Alaska okay. and probably pretty good production in Alberta. And one of the one of the challenges, though, that's worthy of mention is mm-hmm. Klamath, which is an incredibly important place. It's an important breeding area. It's an incredibly important molting area for sort of those mallards that breed in California. And it's a really important sort of, it's sort of the bottleneck in the migration from birds coming to the north into California was in terrible shape again this year. Okay. And, and, you know, that's having long-term consequences on ducks and duck hunting in California. Okay. And it's, it's a real tragedy. Okay, so average to slightly above average, and that slightly above average expectation comes from Damn. the prospect of some young birds. We love young birds, yeah. right? Yeah. They haven't seen the gun before, much more susceptible to harvest. So that's the bright spot. And so then I think you know, the discussions about diving ducks, again, you guys talked about the center part of the, of, of the flyway system is it, you know, contributes to all four flyways. So we should expect a typical diving duck flight for the, I don't know. Know. Cans are going to be way down. Not canvas specs are, uh, you know, we, we always think of canvas specs as Chesapeake Bay, but in Mm -hmm. fact, cans are spread all over. You know, there's a phenomenally important group of cans that, go down the Mississippi River, Catahoula Lake, and mm-hmm. then the Mississippi Delta. Uh, and then there's cans that go to San Francisco Bay. But all those cans come from the parkland region mm-hmm. in, okay. in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba. And it was tough because Saskatchewan holds the majority of the parklands, and Saskatchewan was pretty dry. Mm-hmm. So uh, so I don't think cans are going to have a good year. Okay. They did okay in Manitoba. It was wet in Manitoba. Once you get into Saskatchewan, it's dried out, and then you get back into Alberta, it's wet. So for half of their habitat, it was dry. Okay. For half, it was wet. So the other, the other thing have... that's fascinating to me that I, until I've spent some time in the Pacific Flyway, I never would imagine ringnecks were important there. Yeah. Ringnecks mm. are important everywhere. Yeah, ringnecks <laughs> are important everywhere. And I mean, yeah. you know, the guys hunting in, yeah. you know, South Central Washington shoot ringnecks. Um, I remember being at a duck club years and years and years ago in the grasslands, which, you know, used to be, it used to be pintail and green wing teal habitat. The number two duck in their bag were ringnecks. Yes, yes. And those are all coming out of the Western boreal hmm. forest. And ringnecks seem to be the duck of the future because they nest in a place where habitat's always pretty decent and they seem to be they continue to increase. Like crazy. And so, you mm-hmm. know, based on ringnecks, you'd say, oh, they're going to have a good season yeah. just because, because they're, they're ringnecks. ringnecks. <laughs> <laughs> they always do well. Yeah. Okay, so we've yeah. two things. So average, to slightly above average expectation for the Pacific Flyway and ringnecks are under-celebrated. We've yes, established totally under-celebrated. Two things. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sounds good. Okay, Frank, let's go to... And they taste great. i got to put that in. Yeah, they, <laughs> they all yeah, taste for great. For Frank to say that about a diving duck is a remarkable accomplishment. They all taste the great. They're just tough to get that they're tough the, to get skin. that skin off yeah, yeah. Pluck that's em. all yeah. pluck ring neck ring neck is great yeah. so sent the center two flyways frank you comfortable with that yeah uh you know i think i think the center two flyways are going to have a good year um well, look at the the five areas south dakota great production north dakota great production manitoba very good production it was quite wet now only 20 percent of of the canadian habitat is in manitoba Unfortunately, the the bulk of the Canadian habitat is in Saskatchewan, and it ranged from the eastern side was pretty wet, and then out by Alberta was pretty wet, but the center 
the core okay. was dry. Um, and then Alberta wet. So overall, I think we're going to have a good production year in, in the, okay. for the center two flyways. You know, we have teal season coming up. You know, when I was in Louisiana, I was just super excited about teal season. And I think it's going to be a phenomenal teal season because some ducks settle from south to north. So blue wings come back to the prairies, and when they see water in South Dakota, they say, I'm sitting here. And so we had tons of blue wings settle in, in South Dakota and North Dakota. In North Dakota, the duck that made the biggest jump, a huge increase from last year, is blue wings. Yeah. You know, they settle where it's wet, and we were super wet this year, and last year was much drier in North okay. Dakota. So I think the, the teal season is going to be, you know, phenomenal. The only trick with teal season is you get 16 days and you put them here, and then if we get a freeze in in Saskatchewan in September and, and North Dakota. They've come through yeah. before teal season. Okay. And so you got the, the complications of, hard. of hitting the right migration peak. Because most okay. of them are leaving the states. That's why we have a teal season. So um, and for ducks like Gadwall, I think they're gonna do really well. Redheads tend to not be like Kansas. Cans all go to the parkland. Redheads will settle in the prairies. And so yeah. redheads have had a couple of years in a row where they had good conditions in South Dakota and they'll settle here and breathe. Um, so I think we're, I think we're going to do, have a good year. You know, we had a high breeding count and then we had average or above average production in most regions except Saskatchewan. So okay. I think if I was, a I'd duck, be excited if I were in Louisiana or Texas or right. Arkansas. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I think if I was a duck, I'd be one of those that would settle where there was water yeah i mean if you just i i, I yeah. go to saskatchewan yeah. every year you're yeah. gonna yeah. Have you have happy a few, you're gonna have a few bad years other yeah. you know it's interesting there's so many folks putting radios on ducks in in tennessee just did it jamie Federson and, and i don't know who his collaborators are in tennessee yeah. but you know they put radios on on some mallards uh i think it was postseason and I watched those ducks, and I think Arkansas did the same thing. And it's interesting. There are some ducks that just sort of defy logic, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of those mallards went straight back to Saskatchewan, and you're kind of looking at them saying, listen, Why? you just flew <laughs> over <laughs> great habitat, great habitat <laughs> to go to a place that has really, frankly, pretty crappy yeah. nest success and yeah. pretty crummy wetland conditions. And, and you just sort of wonder why ducks do what they do. I think Chris... Nikolai told me about a pintail that was uh, nesting north of Belfouche. I mean, you wouldn't think Belfouche, North Dakota, or yeah. South Dakota, it's out there in the antelope country, right? You antelope mm -hmm. hunt out, hunted out in that country, and it's dry, it's arid, but, you know, I think Rocco would tell you that was some of the, they yeah. were crazy wet out there, too, and why a pintail ended up out there in antelope country mm. they ducks do what they do and yeah. you find you know the more you put radios on them does it, it doesn't mean all the mallards went to saskatchewan it just meant a mallard went yeah. to saskatchewan they all make different choices yeah. that belfouche is funny because if anybody who watches westerns i watch a few westerns <laughs> that's a setting for many an old western right. movie so mm -hmm. to, to start talking about ducks think, and uh, belfouche, duck breeding yeah, yeah. it's yeah, not exactly know. prairie bottle yeah. no it's dugout it's yeah. dugout can't cattle dugout country no it's cool yeah. and so i guess before we leave this you know the central mississippi flyway wetland or wet conditions and dry conditions are very important if it was just constantly wet we would have declining productivity etc cetera, etc cetera, right yeah so but if you are going to choose an area to be wet and an area to be dry typically you favor the united states being wet right okay i do you don't okay? yeah yeah uh you know we've we've had really good wetland conditions when i was a kid going to school uh you know i learned about waterfowl biology and we all knew that that the states were pretty irrelevant canada produced all the ducks mm -hmm. well in the era of fox disappearing from the system crp speaking and incredible water in the dakotas the u.s side of, of the 49th actually produced more ducks than the canadian side and in in a bunch of years and we never would have dreamed that would right. happen so, and pintail so, pintail was yeah. i remember pintails didn't a used to be a north ago. dakota duck and yet they've shown phenomenal increase. yeah i, I remember yeah. back in early 2010 2011 when we were crazy crazy wet yeah 
you know, we had more breeding pintails in the U.S. prairies than the Canadian prairies, and that would have been Who unthinkable have to Al Hochbaum yeah. or yeah. Art Hawkins or yeah. Jer Jer yeah. Jerry Stout yeah. and the rest right. of those guys. The pioneers of waterfowl biology. Never would have imagined. Yeah. So, so uh, a guy named Johnny Lynch once said that, that, you know, we get great duck production when the prairies are wet. And right. so the prairies are boom and bust, and, and, you know, three years out of ten, they're flat out bone dry. And not producing duck one, but when they're super wet, watch out. Okay. And and we've seen that in terms of, you know, what drives duck production. You got to have pairs. You got to have water, but you also have to have nest hatch. And we've seen right. nest success phenomenally variable in the prairies. In some years, and particularly in years after a drought, after the prairies have been dry, we get great production. Now, do we get great production because the predators had a tough time in the drought and they didn't rebound? The ducks come settle in, mm -hmm. and we get great production. Or do we get great production because of something called a reservoir effect? You dry it out, the nutrients become available, they, they degrade in with the oxygen, and then the plants grow and the invertebrates grow, and so the ponds are super productive. It's probably a combination of both. But we do know from recent studies, nice eagle flying by, <laughs> uh, a little distracting. A number of distractions. <laughs> um, Pelicans are good. That, that after a drought, we get really good production. Mm -hmm. And we suspect it's both things. The wetlands producing more food for the mother and, and the duckling, And there just aren't as many predators. You know, I okay. want to go back to what you said about Johnny Lynch. Because mm -hmm. I think Johnny Lynch should be pretty struck by how things have changed Change. so dramatically. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, if you looked at the 50s, 60s, 70s even, into the 80s, Johnny was probably right, is that the prairies were a 3 and 10 proposition or 4 and 10 proposition. I'd suggest that in the last 20 years, that's become completely inverted. Had a flop, yeah. Because the, the Dakotas have been, from 1994 to today, which I'll say is sort of the new normal, and yeah. Mike Szymanski referenced that in the Game and Fish report this year, we're wet more than we're dry. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. been remarkably wet. For, We've had a long... Persistent, yeah. John and I, uh, at, at times when we're pessimistic, keep wondering, when's the drought coming? We, we're overdue. Mm -hmm. you know, typically, every 10 years, we have a drought that lasts two or three years, and the duck population crashes. And we're still floating high. And, we, high. and yeah. we've had droughts, yeah. right? We've yeah. been, I don't know, yeah. we certainly haven't had the kind of wall-to-wall -wall drought like we had in the 80s and before. Right. But, you know, yeah, we're dry for a couple of years, production falters, but then we get a deluge again. And, yeah. and you know, you drive around North Dakota in places that were mm -hmm. cattail sloughs are now, there are guys with 18-foot rangers jigging right. walleyes, right? It's been about, so, for this part of the, of the world, it's been about 15 years probably since we've had a real doozy of drought. Yeah. I mean, we've got, we mid certainly, we've certainly got, yeah, well, there was a little spell there, 2001 through yeah. 2003, and listen, Prior to last year, we we sort of dried up, and I think that yeah. we were feeling feeling the effects from a duck production perspective, sure. not having great production. But we haven't had a drought like the '80s, yeah. where I drove around in rugby North Dakota and couldn't find a place to duck hunt right. in nineteen, you know, nineteen ninety. Okay. Well, let's scoot on out east. Flyway. Okay. Yeah. So, John, you want to talk us through or start lead us through? The Atlantic Flyway? Yeah, I'll start. I mean, the Atlantic Flyway is, you know, most of the core breeding areas for a lot of ducks in the Atlantic Flyway. We talked about the ducks that come from the U.S. and Canadian prairies that influence and have a big impact on duck hunting in the Atlantic Flyway. But a lot of the, you know, eastern breeding areas are also like the, you know, Alaska and those river deltas, that they're okay. very stable. Yeah. And you don't have this incredible variability in water conditions. You know, they're not dealing with 0.1 acre temporary wetlands like mm -hmm. we have out here. It's lakes, it's ponds. Uh, per, you know, as you, as you go from, you know, the prairies east, you see this precipitation gradient. Their precipitation is considerably more dependable. Sure. The, the average means something. Yeah. In a place like Ontario or yeah. or New Hampshire or Pennsylvania, the average here just means it's just a data point. Right. We never hit the average here. We're either wet or we're dry, and the average the mean doesn't mean very much. So those areas have this sort of nice, easy, flat mm -hmm. sort of habitat conditions, and as a result, have this sort of nice, easy, flat production. 
Um, they just don't have the variability that we have okay. out in this part of the world. So long term, though, what you have, what's what's the population trend for for the <laughs> well, for the East Coast? It's yeah, I mean, you know, it depends on the species, but you know, we've been watching this steady decline of mallards out there. Mm -hmm. In it's, you know, when you think of it globally, you think of eastern mallards. Right we're seeing this 2% annual decline. But that sort of masks what I think is an interesting phenomenon is that the Northeast population is declining. Northeast so of the think United of the States. U.S. Yeah, yeah the U.S., U.S. Uh, New York, Pennsylvania, yeah. and, and then the all up to Maine. Right. That population is declining but much the more rapidly than the one in Canada. Yeah, Canada is actually stable left. to increase. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, in, in boy, I tell you that... <laughs> We're going to talk about it later today, but we just don't understand what's happening there. I mean, I think if you, you know, if you drove around North Dakota in 1950 and then you drove around North Dakota or Saskatchewan today and you looked at it from the 50s to today, you'd say, well, golly gee whiz, well, yeah. I, I understand why we have less stuff. Look at all the temporaries and seasonals that are drained. Right, that's right. Right, right. But if you look at, I don't think New yeah. York has changed or Pennsylvania has changed that much. And so... You know, the mallard population's been in decline. You know, a bunch of the rest of those ducks that are, you know, wood ducks are doing fine. Green wings come out of eastern Canada and probably a little bit out of western Canada. They're doing fine. Black ducks have sort of come in if they have a new equilibrium. Ducks decline, but seem to tail no, out. The decline has is, is dropped off. So. Okay. So, I mean, I, you know, again, you're probably never going to have a year in Ontario, Quebec, or the northeastern U.S., where everybody's going to run around and go, holy cow, it's the hatch of the come. century, yeah. right? Yeah. But you're probably all, you're not, the, the reason, part of the big reason to go to an eastern mallard model was driven by the fact that those guys didn't want to be tied to the dry this prairies. phenomenal fluctuation in mallards that we see in the prairies. They didn't want to be tied to that. Because their mallards, if you look at the, the mallard numbers, there's no fluctuation. It's just a slow, steady decline. Okay. And there's no jump from year to year. Right. Uh, and know. so those so guys we don't wanted expect, to be... You know, a whole lot of difference in mallards, black ducks, wood ducks. You know, a lot of the key species. Ringnecks, as we said, are immune to everything. They just keep increasing. So the yeah. only ducks that fluctuate are the things that come from the prairies. Coming from the prairies. Okay. So for the Atlantic Flyway, you could sort of say, well... Mallards, black ducks, wood ducks, all those things are going to be the same old, same old. And what's going to change is we've had pretty good production for things like blue wings. Gadwalls. Blue wings, blue wings gadwall, pintail, widgeon, you know, the secondary species. You know, redheads, you know, not terribly unimportant. They, they, you know, come into the Chesapeake Bay, they had a good year. So, okay. so for a bunch of ducks, things are good. For the other ducks, they're average. You can almost always, always say that. Always, yeah. <laughs> so. so average to good depending on where they come from. And so you kind of hinted at, well, you touched on something there. So not all that long ago, seasons set for the Atlantic Flyway were linked to the traditional survey area. Yeah. Uh, and got to go back about yeah, 1991, 15, 20 years. Yeah, yeah. I think you yeah. can go back yeah. further. Right. We're getting right. older. Right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> You're 10 years older yeah. than you remembered you were. So then right, it's so. not all that long ago <laughs> yeah. in the context yeah. of our lifespan. So way back when, when I was a kid shooting in the Chesapeake Bay, our seasons were set by what happened in the mid con Okay. And then they said, wait, but our mallards come from a different area and they're much more stable. So we're going to build a harvest model around mallards. And that worked for a bunch of years. But then we started to see this decline that John's been talking about. It's much more prominent in the U.S. It's not happening in eastern Canada mallards. But they wisely said, wait a minute, let's link our seasons now to a different harvest model. Okay. This just came into being. And it's interesting, they, they look at wood ducks, ringnecks, those are the two big drivers, but green wings and golden eyes. Golden eyes. And so, yeah, golden eyes. What? Hmm. <laughs> anyway, and so those are the four species. That the fluctuations in those numbers are what you know, hmm. determine whether you have a closed season or a 60-day season. Okay. And many Atlantic flyway hunters have no idea of it. Had they stuck with the Mallard model, the prescription closed. You for know, last year? For last year. That's pretty wow. dramatic. So thank goodness. We don't know whether it would have actually happened, but I... I 
I suspect it might have because okay. the Fish and Wildlife Service is now so tightly tied to these harvest markets. Okay. So, average to above average, depending on what species you're looking at, yeah. right? So, if it's more of an Atlantic Flyway uh, produced duck, pretty typical season. Should expect that looking backwards, going forwards, and then again the good good production coming out of the prairies, with the exception of cams. Right. Okay. Well, sounds good. So what I'm hearing is, duck hunters, shine up your guns, paint your decoys, yeah. catch those waders, get out there, right? Yeah, and I think one of the things that, and I think it was a bit sort of startling for us when we really understood what it meant. And we talked, you know, Frank talked earlier about the linkage between production and harvest. And you look at it numerically, and you know, one thing's the best in the absence of brood survey, we haven't had them since the late 90s, the best way for us to understand what production was is actually look back in time and use age ratios. And and in age ratios are the number of juveniles we have to adult and harvest. And when you start thinking about the difference, you know, when I started at Delta and didn't know anything about an age ratio in 1998, you know, Lloyd Jones told me that 1.0 was sort of your break even point, right? Well, you start looking at years like 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, when we had really, really wet conditions, mm -hmm. you had age ratios approaching two or yeah. over two. Yeah. So now, we two don't know ducklings per, per two juveniles two, two per juveniles. Juveniles. Yeah. in the, in the per harvest, hill. right? And then you take dry years and you get actually below one. You'll yeah. see mallard and pintail age ratios six. under yeah. one. Right. And so think of what that means numerically. It has a profound impact. And what we know about what we know about duck hunting in, in ducks is that we disproportionately shoot young ducks. Yeah. And so not only is there this, when you talk about a fall flight, the fall flight is driven not by the breeding population, it's the number of juveniles sure. that are coming out. And so just numerically, there's a heck of a lot more of them when mm -hmm. we have good production or less of them when we have poor production. But the other thing is, we know juveniles make more bad decisions. <laughs> and so they're more likely to fall for bad calling or maybe you don't yeah. need to be covered up as well. And, and the thing that's always fascinated me is goose hunters intuitively know this. Yeah. Goose hunters are wired in. The guys that really chase snow geese, what's a hatch look like? What's yeah. a hatch look like? What's a hatch look like? And when they're scouting, they're, you know, they're glassing a field and they know that there are no juveniles in this field or it is all a bunch of graybacks and we are going to shoot the heck out of those yeah. geese in the morning. With duck hunters, we don't have that same sort of feedback mechanism. If we get a mallard, most guys aren't going to age that mallard. When a guy shoots a snow goose, he knows it's either a big, shiny, white adult juvenile. or it's a juvenile. Right. And, and so there's this feedback mechanism that we lack in, in duck hunting that I think has had a pretty profound impact on the way guys view the world. Because right. I think folks aren't, I don't think duck hunters are quite as intuitively tied to production is snow goose hunters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I really think that no matter what you're hunting, but when you go into a season, you have expectations, right? And I think what we're trying to do here is set proper expectations for duck hunters across the U.S. and Canada, right? And so, you know, don't expect the best year of your life, although even in the crappiest of times, Geographically, someone's going to have the best somebody's season ever. Shoot ducks, and right? Somebody's right. not. Right. And in the best of times, it's going to be yeah. somebody's worst duck season. So all we can say is what's out there and what we think will be out there yeah. for for ducks. And I, I mean, I, I'm curious, Frank, to get your thoughts because I've thought about it a lot over the course of the summer. Last year, you know, North Dakota started kind of dry yeah. and got phenomenally wet through the nesting season. This year, North Dakota started pretty wet, but, and I think we're seeing this with the brood survey, got a little dry in places. Right, I mean, right. what's your thought on what has more predictive potential for, what's going to drive duck production in the fall flight more? Do you want to dry and get wet over like we got last year, or would you rather have more breeders and maybe some places get a little drier? I'd take this year over, over last year. Would you? Yeah, just because, you know, you start out... And 
and if you don't start with a good breeding population like it's last hard year, to, it's hard to make. You can't get good. Breeding. Right. When you start with a great breeding population like we had this year, and you get a good pulse, you know, it was wet as heck, even here. You know, we produced a heck of a lot of broods in those here, dry wetlands that are because they up. got in, yeah. nested, yeah. and were successful mm-hmm. and got out. Um, now, eastern North Dakota is producing broods all summer because even a female that failed three times, re-nest. it's so wet, she's going to re-nest, right. and, and her brood's going to do great. So I think this year. Well, and it's but, interesting, you know, we were talking to some of the research folks doing research in northeastern North Dakota, and, you know, we got a little shot, you know, we got a shot of rain there at the end of June, and they said just almost like that, we saw a big uptick in nest initiation, started finding nests again. So these ducks are pretty funny. You know, this this is where they've come from. This is a system they've developed, and they've built strategies to take yeah. advantage of these Yeah, conditions. they have a reproductive strategy that's built around okay, drought wet, go yep. for it. When it's got not it. wet, save yourself for next year. Okay, yeah. well, I think... We'll probably wrap up here. Um, you guys open for questions if anybody needs to, to reach out. Yeah. That's reach what I love out. about Delta. Yeah. We've yeah. all been here a long time, and yeah. it's never changed, top to bottom. You have a question, pick up the phone, and anybody yeah. will yeah. answer the phone. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I love the interaction. That's yeah, so nice pick up the fun. phone, go to our website, yeah. call us up. If you don't like what you heard, it's their fault. <laughs> okay? As it usually is. That's right. It's your fault. So... And if you love it, it's, you know, Joel's the praise on me. Okay. So thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. You know, for those of you listening, um, again, thanks for your time. If you have comments or feedback, we'd love to hear it. You know, we've been collecting questions, um, you know, uh, listener questions through our Instagram and Facebook pages. So if you have questions, we're going to do a Q&A podcast at some point here, um, probably in the next few weeks. So if you have questions, something you've always wanted to know, send it in. And we'll and we'll go through those questions. So before this, duck season, before duck season, <laughs> it's going to be duck season somewhere. Uh, our duck soon. season. I'm yeah. not worried about anybody not else's. Not before our duck season. That's really darn quick. I think geese are opening up. They're now yeah. right now. Yeah. Open yeah. Saturday. Couple, oh wow! All right. So we're going to follow this up really quickly with a goose fall flight forecast, and we're going to have. Dr. Chris Nikolai, he's a guy who spent a lot of time in the Arctic. I think 20 years he spent Mm -hmm. at some of these Arctic goose camps. And so we're going to talk about, you know, what is, geese are more of a mystery to me than ducks. I mean, you can go around and see the ducks, but, you know, the the geese are something of mystery, of fantasy to me. And so Chris is going to open that up a little bit. And we're going to go off a lot of the same thing, you know, a lot of, um, anecdotal information guesswork history nobody was working in the arctic because of covid so yeah your, and it's a little and nobody's even driving around up there so it's right. going off snow melt more than anything yeah right? but, so but we in, make predictions yeah. awesome yeah. yeah so if you've been tuning in and seeing this podcast through youtube you know consider downloading an audio version go to apple tune in stitcher you know that for me it's a great way to consume podcasts listening you know in the car in a car ride or in my in my garage. So, I guess until then, thanks again guys and thanks, thanks everybody. everybody for listening yep. and until next time take care.